So I have another little bit of trivia question here for you. Why did the octopus cross the floor? Who votes to go to the bathroom? Who votes to go fishing? Who votes to go find a girlfriend? <laughs> you know, it always surprises me because only on cruise ships do people think this way. <laughs> it's actually to go fishing. And this has been documented several times now. But many places where you have the aquaria, you'll have the octopus in a tank, and on the other side of the room, there'll be tanks full of fish. Well, they have discovered that the octopus will leave its tank, go across, get into the tank on the other side, and eat the fish. But you know what the difference is? The smart octopus gets back into its tank before the morning. The ones that aren't so bright are still sitting there in an empty tank, kind of with a guilty look on their face. <laughs> So this is documented. Octopus can cross the floor. They can actually survive out of the water for a, you know, a few minutes, um, well, even up to an hour, probably. And uh, because they, ha they do, um, they have gills, but uh, they manage to make it across if they're looking for food. So the octopus is a, an amazing creature when you think that it has nothing but muscles and guts, really. And it has that beak. Very much like the squid, it has a parrot-like beak. But there's no bones or claws. It doesn't have the claws of a squid. It has eight arms. But the big thing is that they have a lot of intelligence. For a creature that lives in the ocean, they're remarkable. And it's really hard to believe that these octopus are related to mollusks, are, are one of the mollusks related to clams. And they're a highly adapted, I, I won't say clam, but it, you know, mollusk, highly adapted. And what they've done is they've taken the clam sort of physiology and They've turned the foot into the eight arms or tentacles. They've gotten rid of any kind of a shell, and they've retained, they've kept this beak-like structure. The thing about the beak is, it's really the only hard, bony part of an octopus. So that's the only part that really restricts the size of the opening that they can go through. And I'll show you that. So if you go back a long ways, this is 400, over 400 million years, early octopus looked like these creatures with shells. You can see that they've adapted from the clams, they've retained their shells. But now, over the 400 million years, they've largely lost their shells. And that means that uh, in ordinary terms, they would be very defenseless. They don't have a hard shell to hide under, but they've come up with mechanisms, uh, such as the ink. You can see the ink. Uh, it forms a big cloud that they can escape through. Uh, they can, I'll show you how they change their skin patterns. Uh, they're the masters of camouflage. So they've, and not only that, they've developed the high intelligence that can allow them to escape from predators. Now this is a, a quite a small octopus in the waters off of Indonesia and they've learned how to use half coconut shells to for protection. So here you can see he's but when they have a coconut shell that they really like you would think well how can they carry that coconut shell? Well they have figured it out. They pick up the coconut shell here he is underneath, and if you look very carefully, you can see he's sort of peeking out from underneath his shell. So you know the size of a coconut. It's a fairly small octopus. Now he's going to demonstrate <clears throat> the very fine art of carrying your coconut shell across the sandy bottom. 
They are literally walking with the coconut shell as they, they keep their favorite. It's just a, an amazing adaptation. And it just shows you how bright these tiny octopus really are. Now this one here, he's figured out why do one coconut shell when two will actually work much better? So there he is inside two coconut shells. And if you look carefully, his little beady eyeballs, he's peeking out, making sure that the, he's, he's protected from the predators. And one final little trick as he walks away to show you how to carry a coconut shell. So these are f very, uh, these animals can learn because the idea of a half cut coconut shell has not been around for that long. So it's human beings that are throwing these coconut shells overboard and these interesting little octopi are figuring out how to use them. Here's one thing I'm really glad I'm not an octopus because we have about 10% efficiency when we convert our food to tissue. They're about 50%. Could you imagine being on the cruise ship and being 50% efficient? It would, be, <laughs> it would be a challenge. Now the biggest ones in the world live in our area, the giant Pacific octopus over on the west coast. But they are found in the waters throughout the world. You can see off the coast of South America, tiny population off of uh, South Africa, New Zealand, and uh, probably the largest one is uh, on the North Pacific all the way over to Japan, Alaska, and Russian waters. These creatures, if the largest giant Pacific octopus were on the stage here and sitting in the middle, its arms would reach to the either side. Now imagine putting on that much in four years. This shows you that a very small slit, like less than an inch, a giant Pacific octopus can still crawl through it. Because the only size restriction is based on the size of the beak. These are one of the very, very few marine creatures which are not mammals that actually need to be entertained if you keep them in an aquarium. They literally have to figure out how to give them toys to play with, otherwise they get bored. And uh, they're about as smart as your average dog, a very different type of intelligence. They can figure out, if you can see here, uh, there's a a uh, screw top lid with a jar and inside the jar there's some food. They can learn how to unscrew the lid of the jar. But I think the next one is even better. If you give them, you know one of those child proof pill lids for medicine and then you put some herring inside and you put some holes so they can smell that there's herring inside they can open the childproof lid. And in the experiments that they've done, the first time it took almost an hour, 55 minutes. But after practicing, they get it down to five minutes. They can open the childproof lid. I'm very disappointed because it still takes me eight minutes. <laughs> That's a pretty smart and quick learning creature. But you know, even though they have the largest brain of any invertebrate, what we've discovered is that 60% is in the arms. So each arm of an octopus almost has a mini brain of its own, which I think is something that uh, has many advantages. So each arm can literally, quite literally, think on its own. And now we're realizing that when an octopus decides that he wants to reach into a little cavern and look for a crab or a clam, 
Crabs are its favorite meal. All it does is tell its arm, go there and feel it. And they have taste buds on their suckers, so they feel into the crevice. But the central brain is not really controlling it. So eight arms are doing their own thing. And the funny thing is, we know exactly where our arm is. If we put it behind our back, we have a sense called proprioception, and we know where our arm is. The octopus doesn't. Once the octopus tells its arm to do something, if it's out of sight, it really doesn't know what's going on. It has to be able to see its arm to actually locate where it is. So you can see there's some interesting kind of adaptations, but big differences from our style of intelligence. So each arm does its own thing, and 50 million neurons in, its, in each arm. These arms can regrow if you cut them off. And nasty scientists have come up with an experiment where they cut off the arm of an octopus, give it a bit of food, and that arm will actually try to put the food where the mouth should be. That little mini brain in the arm is still operating. Nasty experiment. And as I mentioned, they have taste buds on these suckers. But you can start to see that the neural network for an octopus is incredibly complex. It has all these neurons, taste buds, and the central command system. But what, the, what they can do with their skin is another amazing ability. If you look at this, you'll see, look very carefully at that rock. That was an octopus. And there it is, takes off with its uh, shadow, its uh, cloud of ink. So now this is going to be in reverse. If you watch carefully, you'll see how that octopus blends in with a rock that's covered in algae and seaweed. Watch very carefully here. If you looked at that, you would have no idea, really, that there's an octopus that's sitting on that rock. So they can blend in almost amazingly ability by changing the color and texture of their skin. And it's because they have these cells that are called chromatophore, but their skin is covered with hundreds of thousands of chromatophore, and each one has six muscles that changes shape to change the color of that chromatophore. So now, on top of the eight arms, with all those suckers and all those taste buds, now they have all this chromatophores all over their skin, changing colors constantly. And on top of that, they can change the texture of their skin. So here's an octopus blending in with the seaweed in the background, literally changing the texture, all the little bumps and nodules on his skin. A lot of brain power going on to do all of this. Okay, I'm almost close to the end of my talk, and I, I want to end up on this very interesting topic. What's the most interesting, or not the most interesting, what's the worst thing you can do for a long life as an octopus? And I think you'll know the answer. If you're an octopus, the worst thing you can do is hanky-panky. Because... It shortens your lifespan dramatically. If you're an octopus, the female sends out pheromones, which are the chemicals that would go through the water. The male would pick up this chemical and be attracted to the female. And so once the female has mated, she puts her eggs into a cave and many, many eggs, up to 100,000 eggs in a string, and her job is to stay with the eggs and to keep them aerated with fresh water, with full of oxygen. So she'll do that for weeks. And then once the eggs have hatched, 
that's the end of her life. She does not eat during this stage, and she'll, that's the end of it. She'll die. So this can last up to seven months that she'll be aerating the eggs. If the octopus does not have sex, it could live up to five years. That's almost the, the extreme. But any time a male or a female has reproductive sex, that's it. They start to go downhill. Now in this case, the female is this one here, and this is the male, and he has a special arm where he delivers a sperm packet to the female. But it's very gentle. And you can see he tries to keep his distance because this can be a dangerous procedure. That arm is called the hectocotylus. And here's another male, and you can see the length of his arm. Once the male has delivered the sperm packet to the female, that's it. His life is over. He stops eating. He becomes erratic. He becomes grumpy. Things change dramatically. So this period is called senescence. And you know what? Both octopus and human beings, mammals, have a period of senescence. The thing is, with the octopus, it's very short-lived. It's a matter of weeks. With human males, it can go on and on and on. <laughs> have any of the wives noticed this? It explains. So I'd like to finish off with the lessons from today. Sex can shorten your life. Old guys get grumpy. Tell me something new. And tentacles are a great way of gathering food. So I want to show you something that I, I've invented a prototype that uh, I'd like to work on. It's, I call it the help yourself dining maximizer. Because when I'm sitting at a table of eight people and I see something across that I would really like to have a sample of, I'm going to start bringing my dining maximizer. So thank you so much for coming along, folks.